All right, everyone, we'll just make a quick start. I'm Priya, for those of you who don't know me. This is, I, I believe, the last conference for this year. So. <laughs> no, there'll be more chest x-ray conferences, for sure. Um, so I'm going to talk about pulmonary infections in HIV-positive patients. I'm not important enough to have disclosures. Um, I kind of want to set the stage by highlighting the importance of this topic, especially within our subspecialty. Um, so this was actually the first ever medical publication of um, HIV patients. So you can look at the date here. It's 1981. Uh, and this was the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report uh, published by um, UCLA in conjunction with CDC. And they actually describe over a period of um, five months, uh, five separate patients who was diagnosed with PCP pneumonia. So actually, I should just say pneumocystis pneumonia or PCP. Uh, and they were proven to be positive by antemortem lung biopsy, actually, at that point. So the first time we're hearing about HIV is basically opportunistic infections, and the first thing that comes up is a lung-related complication, uh, PCP. Uh, this slide just shows you the scale of the problem within U.S. So CDC published this in 2013, showing only 37% of people are actually on antiretroviral treatment, which is important for us to know, especially when we're trying to make diagnostic and treatment decisions when we see these patients. Um, I thought this was, table was important. Again, this is something from the CDC um, because it shows you really the number of pulmonary related complications or conditions that are included in AIDS defining uh, conditions. So AIDS defining conditions occurs when you have a CDC count that's less than 200. And if you have any of the listed uh, conditions in this table. I just kind of put arrows where I thought it was interesting for us as pulmonologists. Uh, one thing that stood out to me on my reading was recurrent pneumonias, and this can be from any form. So moving on, um, this talk is just going to consist of some of the key uh, infections that I read about in terms of its frequency. You'll notice that there's glaring exceptions here, namely uh, mycobacterial infections as well as fungal. I chose not to include those, not because they were not important, it's just that it's a topic by itself, and I think we're going to run out of time if we go on to those topics. Um, so before we kind of discuss that, I just wanted to show you this graph here because it illustrates some important points. Um, so if I just take you through it step by step, this was uh, HIV outpatient study or HOPS um, that was basically <coughs> done over a 10 year period from 1993 to 2003. Uh, it was an outpatient study conducted by the CDC where they followed over 7,300, sorry, 7,300 patients over 180,000 visits spanning over 10 years. Um, so there, I'm going to guide you through this. The square is the deaths per 100,000, uh, per 100 person years. The triangles, pulmonary related deaths. And then the diamond over here is the percentage of people on antiretroviral treatment. Um, so you can see that at the introduction of ART, somewhere around 95, so more people are starting on ART treatment here, um, all-cause death reduced as well as pulmonary-related deaths. Okay, so this kind of shows you how important art was in terms of changing the landscape of uh, mortality and morbidity, not just from all causes, but for pulmonary-related infections as well. Um, so this is the same paper, the HOPS study. Uh, I guess at that point they didn't 
actually print it out in color. So I <coughs> went ahead and kind of labeled it for you guys. Um, figure two here uh, tells, shows you the pulmonary, cardiovascular, hepatic, as well as renal-related hospitalizations. And you can see pulmonary always was higher than everything else. But after art treatment, the percentages of pulmonary-related uh, hospitalizations went down compared to other conditions, actually went up. Um, and on figure three here, uh, it kind of shows you the different types of pulmonary complications that patients were having. So number one is all pulmonary conditions, two, uh, due to new PCP pneumonia, Number three is non-PCP pneumonia. Four is kind of airway-related diseases. Five, TB, and six, lung cancer. So you can see here for uh, PCP, started going down as the years progressed with art treatment. And number three, so non-PCP pneumonia started increasing with the advent of art. Um, and then on figure four here, uh, I just wanted to highlight that when art was introduced, there's a dramatic reduction in uh, PCP-related um, cases, hospitalization, as well as deaths over the years. Um, so based on my reading, I kind of summarized um, some of the important things that we have to find out when we're evaluating patients with pulmonary complaints in HIV-related populations. Uh, it's important to know demographics, so basically it gives us an idea of the socioeconomic uh, characteristics. Uh, CD4 count is uh, basically the degree of immunosuppression. I put HIV viral road here with the asterisk because it doesn't actually correlate that well with CDC, CD4 count in terms of uh, the state of immunocompromisation. Uh, current and previous residence is important, especially if they're coming from areas where TB or fungal infections are endemic. Uh, use of prophylaxis medications for common infection is important as well, especially things like um, back trim for PCP. Um, smoking related diseases, uh, so if a patient with HIV smokes, they have a higher risk for getting uh, pulmonary infections. Use of art treatment, whether they're still using it, whether they're falling off the wagon, um, is important. So IV drug use, um, there's a higher uh, risk of developing staph-related pneumonia if um, they're using IV drug use, they're using IV drugs in HIV populations. Um, and then the types of infections they may have and you know, associated historical antibiotic treatment. Travel, again, this is related to the endemic disease of the place where they went to. Exposure to active TB, so if they were incarcerated uh, in military. Uh, history of prolonged neutropenia as well is important to ask. Employment and hobbies, uh, there's a special type of bacteria that we'll talk about in a bit in horse breeders, um, and if they're HIV infected, they're more likely to get. So this is just kind of a summary of what we should be thinking about when we're evaluating patients for um, pulmonary complaints. <coughs> okay. um, so this is a table I got from the uh, European Respiratory Journal in 2012, and they kind of summarized really well the cumulative uh, incidence of the different types of pulmonary infiltrates in patients with HIV. So you can see that infectious causes of infiltrates are by far the most common cause. Um, bacterial pneumonia is the most common cause of pu infectious pulmonary infiltrates. You see the most common cause here is strep, followed by H. flu, staph, then the less common ones, Legionella, gram-negative bacillus. PCP is in a category by its own, and we'll talk about it why so in a bit. Uh, and then comes mycobacteriosis, 
and all the different types. TB is the highest. <coughs> so this is the continuation of the same table. Uh, we have viruses that accounts for about 5% of all infectious pulmonary infiltrates. Uh, CMV being the leading cause, followed by influenza. Then you have fungal and parasites, toxo and strongyloides. And then the other causes of non-infectious infiltrates, which we'll not really go ab uh, talk about in this presentation, but there's also pulmonary edema and lung cancer to think about. All right. So I kind of summarize some of the more important characteristics of different types of uh, bacterial infections that are encountered in HIV positive patients. Um, so I'll start off with strep, uh, strep pneumo. So it's by far the most common bacterial cause of pneumonia in HIV positive patients, about 70% incidence. It's the most likely bacteria um, attributed in community acquired pneumonias. Uh, interestingly, in HIV patients, uh, they have a higher risk of developing pneumococcal bacteremia with strep pneumo. And then once they have an episode of strep pneumo, they're more likely to have recurrence uh, pneumococcal pneumonia of up to 10 to 25 percent. H-flu is the next most common bacteria implicated uh, for bacterial pneumonias in HIV patients. Um, it's interesting because it presents in a more subacute cause. Uh, it causes about 50% of bilateral infiltrates that we see for bacterial pneumonias. Staph aureus usually occurs in people who have a uh, history of intravenous drug use. Um, and in HIV patients, it's interesting because they tend to have more complications related to staph aureus, namely bacteremia, endocarditis, septic emboli. Um, and then um, Pseudomonas, uh, interestingly, it's community acquired, especially if your CD4 count is less than 50. So very different from immunocompetent uh, patients who kind of develop this if they're in hospital. Um, and then some of the more uncommon uh, bacterial agents. So Legionella, 40 times more than general populations. Rhodococcus. Um, so this bacteria is actually implicated in horse breeders who are HIV positive. I grouped uh, Rhodococcus and Nocardia together because it uh, looks like they're very commonly misdiagnosed as TB, uh, fungal or malignancy initially because uh, the upper lobe predominant and they are weakly acid, pos uh, acid fast positive. Uh, they kind of recommend that we do brain imaging when we have patients with rhodococcus or nocardia bacterial pneumonia uh, because there is a tendency to embolize to the brain. Um, and then the atypical pneumonias are very uncommon even for HIV patients. Um, so when we talk about bacterial pneumonias, I'm sure all of you are thinking, what's the recommendation for vaccination in uh, HIV-positive patients? So this is published by CDC, and um, again, they actually recommend that we vaccinate patients with HIV. So the polysaccharide vaccine is the Pneumovax PSV23. Uh, they recommend that we actually vaccinate these patients. And then we'll talk about influenza later on in the presentation. Um, so a little bit more about the pneumovax. So CDC and the literature that I've read so far uh, all agree that you know if your CD4 count is more than 200, um, give the pneumovax vaccine as early as possible, even at the time of diagnosis. IDSA recommends this because they think benefits outweigh the risk. When your count is less than 200, the guidelines are a bit more loose in the sense that they say it can be given. There's been no study so far that shows uh, clinical evidence on efficacy. 
Uh, but there is kind of a reported if positive effect if started on art therapy simultaneously. Um, they go on to say that these patients can be re-immunized um, if the first vaccination was given when the CD4 count is less than 200 and then it subsequently improves to more than 200. Uh, unfortunately, we do not know how long the duration of efficacy lasts for um, the new vaccine that's given. And they recommend uh, revaccinations every five years. Uh, it has been shown uh, that pneumovax vaccination actually reduces pneumococcal bacteremia risk. Now I'm going to talk about uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. Uh, so pneumocystis urovecchi was actually formerly known as uh, pneumocystis carinae. And it was renamed after the pathologist, so he's from Czechoslovakia, uh, who first identified uh, the bug in malnourished and premature infants back in the 1930s. It was renamed because pneumocystis carinae was actually never identified in uh, humans. It was actually found in rats. Um, and then the reason why pneumocystis is in a category, category by itself is because by analysis of its uh, genes, uh, it was found that it has characters for both fungus as well as protozoa. So that's why it's in a category by itself. However, unlike normal funguses, it actually lacks the outer layer of um, its carbohydrate outer layer. It's called ergosterol. And that's important because uh, it makes it much more harder to culture. Um, and then a little bit about transmission. So it, it used to be thought that PCP was due to reactivation of latent infection. So there was thought that you would acquire it as an infant and it would only manifest itself at the point of immunocompromised state. However, there's now some evidence that there's cluster outbreaks of PCP among immunocompromised patients, which is why we tend to isolate PCP infected patients compared to other immunocompromised patients when they are in hospital. So this slide here, I just wanted to kind of illustrate the fact that prior to art therapy, the risk of HIV patients developing pneumocystis pneumonia without preventative therapy was approximately 80%, and the likelihood of relapse without secondary prophylaxis was about 70 to 80%. The incidence of HIV-associated PCP in the U.S. peaked about in the 1990s, as seen here in the chart, uh, and then initially declined due to widespread use of PCP prophylaxis. So there's two different things that happened that changed the epidemiology of PCP within HIV-positive patients. So I wanted to talk about primary prophylaxis because we deal quite a lot uh, with PCP prophylaxis, especially in our transplant patients, not so much in HIV patients. Um, but they all share a common immunocompromised state. So there's great A1 evidence. Uh, which is basically based on randomized clinical trials, uh, that initiating primary prophylaxis in HIV patients is recommended, especially if your CD4 count is less than 200 or if there's presence of oropharyngeal candidiasis. The first line is Bactrim, just like what we do in our transplant patients. I also wanted to point it out that um, Inhaled pentamidine is one of the alternative therapies. And I found this interesting x-ray here. So this is a patient that has PCP. And it basically shows redistribution of infiltrates to the upper lobes because inhaled pentamidine would distribute on the mid to lower lobes. So he has redistribution of infiltrates. So it still can occur despite being on primary prophylaxis.
So just going to talk a little bit about presentation. Um, acute PCP actually have a very subacute cause. Uh, patients present with gradual non-specific symptoms. Uh, most of them complain of fever, uh, non-productive cough, progressive dyspnea. Um, when they come in, you'll notice that they have tachycardia, uh, tachypnea, as well as elevated temperatures. Uh, their exam can be normal. Uh, sometimes you can hear inspiratory crackles when the disease is in a more severe form. Um, so I just wanted to show this radiographs here, a collection of them, because PCP can present in any fashion, uh, basically. So the top one here, radiograph A, is basically showing some fine reticular nodular opacities. And then in B, we have uh, parenchymal and subpleural, sorry. This one is the more typical presentation, which is bilateral aspase disease. Um, any guess on C? Anyone? If they see anything? Oh, sorry? Yep, so pneumatoceles at the top here. I'll be honest, the first thing that struck me was the nipple piercings. I didn't really see this subtle change up here. But there's bilateral pneumo pneumoceles at the top. And then D um, is a radiograph of a patient who has actually been treated for uh, PCP. So there's residual infiltrates here. Moving on to some HRC, uh, sorry, CAT scans of patients. HRCT actually has a high sensitivity of up to 100% and a specificity of 89% for the diagnosis of PCP. So if you have uh, CAT scan changes that indicate PCP, it's almost 100%, you're right. Um, so here you have cystic changes, subpleural, as well as parenchymal. Then you also have more subtle ground glass changes here. So I wanted to take a second here to talk about some laboratory data that we can get in patients with uh, PCP. Um, so historically, people have looked at LDH levels. Um, so in Germany, there was a retrospective study done, and it was published in 2011, where they took over 300 patients uh, who were immunocompromised for any reasons, with and without PCP infections. And then they looked at their serum level of LDH at the point of diagnosis. They found that in HIV-positive patients, uh, if the LDH was more than 200, the test was sensitive in up to 100% and specific to 47% for diagnosis of PCP. But the accuracy of elevated LDH in uh, PCP-positive patients who do not have HIV is only 52%. So really, LDH correlates with um, HIV patients. Elevated LDH correlates with PCP infections only in HIV-positive patients. Uh, we have also looked at uh, levels of beta D glucan, uh, which are usually high when there's PCP present, but the precise role is kind of sketchy. We don't really know what to use it, whether to trend it uh, when PCP infection is confirmed. There's something new. Um, now there's a MIC assay pneumocystis kit out there, which uses PCR to diagnose PCP. Um, this study was done in uh, Manchester in the UK where they kind of used PCR assays to target mitochondrial uh, ribosomal large subunits of PCP in BAL specimens. And uh, the tests actually demonstrated a 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity, and a 100% negative predictive value uh, for diagnosing uh, pneumocystis urobichai in BAL specimens. Um, and then you'll notice, I don't know if 
you guys remember, I think about a week or two ago, we received this email about how all our BAL samples that we're sending for direct immunofluorescent assays will now be sent out instead for molecular testing. Um, so I'm not sure if we're actually utilizing this MIG assay here in Henry Ford, but this is what's happening now, that we have moved away from direct immunofluorescent testing to its molecular testing PCR for BAL specimens. Okay. So in the literature, however, uh, the gold standard for diagnosis of PCP is still direct visualization. Uh, they recommend that we visualize either the trophic forms or the cystic forms of the disease. So this one shows you a picture of Gemster stain um, BAL specimen uh, with the cystic form. This is an electron micrograph picture of the trophs. So this is magnified about 7,000 times. And this is actually the direct immunofluorescent testing that we get. Um, so I wanted to put up this table up here because the gold standard for obtaining sputum is actually either induced with hypertonic saline BAL or even open lung biopsy. So with BALs, you're getting up to 95% sensitivity with the test when we try to get uh, sputum samples for direct visualization. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about treatment of PCP. Um, when I was doing my reading, I noticed that there was a uh, importance in figuring out the severity of disease. Does anyone know what, we, what information we need to diagnose severity of PCP? It's a lab value that we get. Yeah, exactly. So the reason why we get that is because the degree of hypoxemia would tell us whether adjunctive um, corticosteroids uh, would help. There's multiple randomized clinical trials uh, that indicate adjunctive corticosteroids and severe to moderate to severe PCP infection actually improves mortality. So if you have a PO2 of less than 70%, sorry, 70 uh, millimeters mercury at room air, or an um, AA gradient of more than 35, then it categorizes the PCP severity as severe, moderate and severe, and they uh, recommend that we start corticosteroids at the time of diagnosis. Um, so this is the treatment regime really and you can see that it's a de-escalating regimen over 21 days. Then in terms of treatment for moderate to severe PCP you'll notice that it's Bactrim and it's IV total of 21 days, you can de-escalate from IV to PO with clinical improvement. This is just a slide showing you treatment for mild to moderate PCP. Uh, no change here, still 21, um, and they do recommend oral treatment with Bactrim or other alternative agents here. Um, so now I'm going to talk about influenza virus. I kind of put up this picture here. I thought it was quite interesting. This is a magnified view of viruses at 100,000 magnification. Um, okay. Um, so I think we are all okay with treatments and what to do with patients, but what about primary prevention with vaccinations? It's a kind of a controversial topic because we all wonder about whether patients with immuno, uh, who are immunocompromised will actually mount a serologic response when we give them vaccinations. Uh, the advisory uh, committee for immunization uh, practices and the Department of Health with CDC all recommend inactivated trivalent influenza vaccinations for HIV patients regardless of their CD4 count. Uh, the thought process is that 
you can actually reduce complications that are related to influenza infections, especially those who have AIDS. And uh, it will reduce the, type, the amount of respiratory symptoms a person has and also documented influenza illnesses. However, there's the question about suboptimal antibody responses. And we, I think we all know that we cannot give life uh, attenuated intranasal influenza vaccine flumist uh, to HIV-infected patients, but you can actually give them to their household contacts as long as they're not immunocompromised. Um, so I just wanted to talk about this study, basically, uh, which was... A study, the only clinical trial done uh, to look at the efficacy of influenza vaccination in HIV patients. So this was published in the Green Journal in 1999. You'll notice that there's only 100 patients total in this study. And then I think the interesting question is, we all want to know what the response is if your CD4 count is low. However, in this study, you can see that the patients with significant immunocompromised state, which is CD4 count less than 200, is a very small amount of patients that was enrolled in the study, in the vaccine and in the placebo groups. Um, they go on to say that there's a statistically significant increase in your uh, titers, which is basically defined as fourfold increase of your antibody titer. However, you'll notice that there's only about 12%, 29%, and 36% responses in the three different types of HIV, I mean, sorry, influenza viruses. So minimal response, and they didn't really take into account groups of patients with severe immunocompromised state, which is CD4 less than 200. So I think we have a couple more slides before the end. Um, this table really serves as an aid memoir, uh, basically looking at the type of uh, infections that are associated with different CD4 counts. You can see that the number of opportunistic infections actually increases as your CD4 count decreases. So when you have CD4 counts more than 500, uh, your kind of prone to things that is common in the general population in immunocompetent patients. And then if your CD4 count is less than 100, you have more uncommon infections like disseminated MAC, fungal, CMV, as well as herpes simplex pneumonitis. Uh, I think this is kind of almost the last slide here. I think this will serve as well in our chest x-ray <coughs> conference not long from now. Uh, this kind of categorizes the types of infiltrates that we see on CT as well as uh, chest x-ray uh, and also the acuity of the symptoms and what type of infiltrates we see for each different organisms. I just wanted to thank Dr. Swidrak for help with this and I'll take questions now. So you can vaccinate anyone at any point, um, <coughs> regardless of their CD4 count. For H influenza, not for influenza. For H influenza. Yeah, influenza. Or I think there was a slide. Sorry, I misheard you. I don't know what happened here. I think I had a graph with all the different types of vaccinations. I mean, it's usually recommended in children, uh, so it's not...
Twenty percent, yep. So all the kind of evidence that I've looked at so far kind of looked at BAL samples or induced sputum and open lung biopsy using the DFA technique, so direct immunofluorescence. I think the technology for the PCR is still kind of new and it's only being adopted very slowly. So I didn't see anything comparing <coughs> open, open or even TBBX biopsy compared to... Um, you know, do, using PCR on BAL. But, you know, the sensitivity is almost 100% for doing PCR. So I think maybe later on, we wouldn't need to be doing TBBX. I mean, that's my gestalt. Some of that data regarding the biopsies, I'm not sure about here, but over at the DMC, mm -hmm. we would do the BALs of these of that nature, and they, they were consistently negative. Mm -hmm. Patients then underwent open lung biopsy, and they were consistently positive. So I ran a test one time.